Hey, everybody, it's Kai. Oh, man. It's entirely possible this GoPro is too close to my face, so I'm just going to wind up with like a ginormous nose in this video. Guess we shall see. Hey, everybody, it's Kai. Thanks for watching. Uh, make me smart on this YouTube thing. Um, always, always just click that subscribe button. It's easier that way for you. It's easier that way for us. I just realized my yoga mat is in my shot, so. Do you want to move it or are you going to leave it? I'm going to leave it. It too late. Sporty. Music has started, man. Sporty Can't move now. nothing. Can't move nothing. Oh. oh, hello, everyone. I'm Molly Wood. <laughs> and I am Kai Rizdahl. This is Make Me Smart, the weekly edition. It's the original, the OG of Make Me Smarts. It's our Tuesday show, a deep dive into one topic, and hopefully all get smarter by the end. Today, we're going to do some small business. We're going to do some people in this economy and how they are getting by um, with the rescue package and the $2 trillion of assistance and actually more this morning that just came out from the Treasury Department about um, the pay check, pay check protection system. They hate it when I pop my P's into the microphone. Um, it's impossible. They literally uh, because, named it PPP. <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, so rude. Because uh, anyway, to the... To, Back to the subject. Um, <laughs> it is a mess getting $2 trillion into this economy, and we are going to uh, put um, our uh, correspondent, our guest, through her paces on this one. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we have Sam Fields, a marketplace reporter who has been covering how money affects people's lives, who has been doing some reporting on the SBA Paycheck Protection Program. Those. Uh, this is to remind you, we talked about this last week, and it made me so upset that I cried on the video, the small business loans that can be forgiven if uh, businesses manage not to, to lay people off, which I think we can all agree is a big if. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, uh, banks have been having a terrible problem getting this program up and running. And uh, in fact, people are already saying that they have been denied loans. So there yeah. are lots and lots of issues. Um, and then I think breaking news as we came in here was that Congress has appropriated another, I believe, $350 billion because yeah. banks, because companies, even though they can't necessarily get their hands on the money, are burning through it so quickly. Um, so with all of that behind us, let's get to you, Sam. Thanks for coming on. Okay. Hey, Thanks guys. Thanks for coming on, Sam. Thanks for having me. Uh, okay. So first things first, would you give us the very quick 30,000-foot view of specifically small businesses and this package and the Paycheck Protection Program? I would say the overwhelming or the overarching word to use is uncertainty. People just don't know what's happening. And that is small businesses, that is banks, that is other kinds of lenders. There's just a lot of uh, clarity that they still don't have about all sorts of aspects of the program about, you know, for banks, uh, what they need to do to actually get the funds to people for a lot of other lenders, um, if they even are going to have access to capital to get it to people. And for small businesses, they just don't know one, some people haven't been able to apply at all. Others have been able to apply but haven't gotten an approval. Others have gotten an approval and haven't gotten funds yet. And so there's a lot of anxiety, too, among small business owners, especially those who haven't been able to apply yet, about the possibility of this pot of money running out, which, Molly, you mentioned up at the top, hmm. is something that clearly people in the federal government are worried about, too. Right. And I guess I should clarify, it looks like thank you to the slacks that came in. Uh, there will be a vote Thursday on whether to appropriate that new amount. But there is this urgency in the air because, as it yeah. turns out, it's first come, first serve, right, this pot of money? Yeah, it is. It's very much a person that I spoke to last week um, before, a couple days before uh, the Friday, um, the applications opened on Friday, said he was urging small businesses if they had the resources, if they possibly could, to get all of their documents ready to and be calling their banker and calling their banker and calling their banker and trying to be first in line. Because it is going to be first come, first serve, both in terms of how quickly you get the money, but also in some cases, whether you get the money at all. Because again, the demand for this is huge. Wells Fargo already closed applications. They closed applications on Sunday after they had opened on Friday. And so some people, some small businesses uh, who had accounts, who have relationships with Wells Fargo, didn't get their applications in on time. Um, I mean, not on time, but they didn't get their applications in before mm -hmm. Sunday and now aren't going to be able to apply with Wells Fargo and are kind of scrambling to see where else they can go. 
Yeah, it's important to say here that Wells Fargo has some capital restrictions put on it because right. of that whole disgraceful thing about about opening the face, fake accounts a couple of three years ago. But mm -hmm. but that's a good point, right? I mean, you know, if you don't have a relationship with your bank, if uh, you're yep. too far back in line, you're going to wind up in some trouble. There's also a um, there's a timing thing here too, Sam. Right? Because businesses have to make decisions about whether to lay people off, like now. Uh, right. And this money is still pending and they have to sort of figure out what to do with that after they're through this process. Yeah, it's really tricky. You know, one interesting thing about this is my understanding is businesses that have already laid people off, because as we know, a lot of businesses have already yeah. laid people off before this this even happened. Um, you can hire your employees back. They're looking at what your payroll was in February. You can hire people back and start paying them again. So. But yes, businesses are, you know, with every passing hour, with every passing day, they're they're needing to make decisions about what to do with their businesses. A lot of businesses, you know, are running out of cash, maybe have already run out of cash. A lot of them operate on really thin margins and time is of the essence here. And, you know, while it's understandable that it's really hard to get a $350 billion lending program, a new program up and running and get money out, you know, within a matter of days or weeks, these businesses needed the money yesterday. Right. Hmm. Why, before we turn to sort of the people um, and everybody who's running one of these small businesses is one of those. But anyway, yeah. before we shift topics, why did this happen this way? You know, there were a couple articles that sort of said, well, in other countries, the government just became payroll. Like it paid hmm. the businesses so that the businesses could keep their people on as opposed to this sort of free for all loan situation where banks were able to lobby for higher interest rates they may or may not be forgivable like is there any sense of why this is the way this is going down in america i don't know the answer to that but honestly a lot of people seem to be asking the question of why this is loans and not grants um, it makes it a lot more complicated and it also makes businesses a lot more anxious in some cases about applying for it because it's unclear how much will be forgiven what the mechanisms for that will be if there's any sort of real certainty of that. There are certain complications that go along with making it a loan program. And so there, there are questions around why that is happening that way. And there are a lot of advocates for small businesses, a lot of small businesses themselves who are saying, hey, you know, we're gonna need more funding. We all know this already. Um, as you guys were saying, Treasury is already asking or planning to ask for another at least $200 billion to shore up this program. Other people are saying in next rounds of funding, make some of it grants, make all of it grants, because one, it will be, um, you know, it won't risk leaving sm small businesses with debt, but also it may be less complicated for people. Um, and another mm -hmm. thing, you know, I just want to flag, you know, as we head into talking about people is one of the biggest concerns here with the small businesses and with, you know, it being kind of first come first serve is that a lot of people who need this money the most, a lot of low income businesses, businesses and minority communities, immigrants, may not have relationships with lenders, may not be able to be first in line and may completely miss out or not get this funding for a long time. And they may be the ones who, who need it now. Yes to all of that. I think it's really important that we acknowledge that the reason these aren't grants and to be completely honest, won't be grants even in another bill is because we have divided government in this country and yeah. not everybody agrees that it ought to be grants. There's a certain, you know, part For of the sure. political spectrum in this country that says, look, bootstraps, use them, you know, Absolutely. Um, we'll, we'll lend you some money, but you got to pay us back. Um, can we talk uh, people here for a minute, uh, Sam, and unemployment? First of all, there has been a, a yeah. huge expansion, but also um, snafus in getting people that money. Yeah, uncertainty here, again, is the word that really pops up and anxiety, which I think we're all sensing a theme. You know, I spoke to a, a young waitress a couple of weeks ago. She was one of the 3.3 million who filed a couple of weeks ago for unemployment. She had been laid off from her waitressing job, her full-time waitressing job um, at a restaurant in Manhattan, along with the entire staff, and uh, spent every single day, hours a day, for a full week trying to call unemployment to file a claim. And she said she would just call and hang up and call and hang up. And she wow. never got hold music. She said she had never in her life uh, hoped to hear elevator music, but she was hoping to hear elevator music. And she literally just got a busy signal every single time. She estimates she called at least 500 times. And the only way she finally got through 
was that the manager of the restaurant was checking in on his people and he said, hey, have you gotten through? I just got through. And she said, no, I still haven't gotten mm. through. And he said, try now. And she did, and she didn't get through. And he's like, let me try for you. And so he called and he was able to get through again. And while they were on hold, he conferenced mm. her in and he waited on the line with her while that's she filed Christ. her claim. Which, wow. I, I mean, I just, I kept thinking about that story because one, that's, I guarantee you that's not happening in most cases. <laughs> that's pretty above and beyond right. for a manager, but that's the only way she got through. She never got through herself and she doesn't know why. Um, and, you know, we're hearing these stories over and over and over again of people calling hundreds, even thousands of times, people going on websites, having them crash. Um, there's just a lot that is, you know, not working very smoothly with millions of people applying for unemployment kind of overnight. Hmm. And then that just a pile, of, I'm just in a pile right on. Um, <laughs> Because that is, so all of that is the trouble that you have if you are, you know, a registered small business or you are a person who qualifies for right. these checks, the stimulus relief yep. checks or unemployment, who, tell us about all the people who are falling through the cracks here. Yeah, it's tricky. There are a lot of people falling through the cracks. With the stimulus checks, pretty much, um, if you have a social security number, so if you're a citizen or if you're a resident who's here, who's not a citizen, but you're an immigrant who's here legally, you should be getting a check if you, you know, hit the income requirements. Um, but undocumented immigrants won't get checks. Uh, people who, you know, dependent adults, so a lot of college students who are over the age of 17, uh, who, you know, are still being claimed by dependents uh, as dependents by their parents, but um, you know won't be eligible for the five hundred dollars for a child. They won't get checks. Their parents won't get checks for them either. Um, so there are there are a lot of holes there. And then with unemployment, you know, it's interesting. Undocumented immigrants again obviously won't be able to apply for unemployment. But even legal immigrants uh, may may be you know afraid to apply because you know this year that. Trump administration um, changed the public charge rule, which makes it, you know, it, it means that it could be held against them. Even if they're a legal immigrant, if they apply for benefits that they're eligible for, like unemployment, it could be held against them if they go to apply for citizenship. And so a lot of people may be afraid to do that, even if technically they could. Um, and then, you know, there are people who may not qualify because they didn't make enough money. Now that's supposed to, I think, be changing under, you know, under the CARES Act provisions, but there are people that I've been reading about who have been applied, who have applied for unemployment and been rejected because they either didn't work for long enough before they applied for unemployment, or that's what they're being told, or they didn't make enough money, they didn't have enough hours. Um, I think technically their part-time workers are supposed to be able to apply. So some of that may be states just not sort of having the guidance for the new rules in place yet. The same thing is kind of true for gig workers and freelancers. They are now eligible for the first time to apply for unemployment under, mm -hmm. under the CARES Act. But a lot of states don't seem to sort of, sort of know how to make that work yet. And so a lot of them yeah. um, are having trouble either getting through, filing, are being rejected, are being told to wait and hold off while states kind of figure out how to make that work. The, uh, the overwhelming theme of this conversation so far is that uh, none of this stuff is happening fast enough, right? And when you consider that 100%. we've been shut down in this economy for going on two yeah. and a half, three weeks now, parts of it for a month, and GDP yeah. per month in this economy is like a trillion point seven five something dollars, right? Almost $2 trillion. Um, let's talk real quick about straight payments to individuals. Those two are not happening perhaps as fast as uh, we need them to happen. Definitely not. Um, I think what you just said is exactly what I've been thinking with all of this, with the stimulus checks, with unemployment, with the SBA loans. It's just not happening fast enough. People needed this money uh, days ago, weeks ago. They need it now, and they may not get it for another couple weeks. With the stimulus checks, um, they should start going out in the next week or so for the, the first mm -hmm. round. Um, but again, that's only going to be some people. It's going to be people who have their data on file for direct deposit with the IRS. Um, and that's a lot of people, of course. And so people may see these checks in the next week or 10 days. But a lot of people, they're saying, may be waiting weeks or months, maybe, um, to get these checks if they don't have direct deposit on file um, and if you know the IRS needs to sort of figure out where to find them. 
Yeah. So, okay, one last question, definitely related to all of that, is that what is in this bill, or are there discussions in future rounds about debt relief? Because it sounds to me like a lot of people and businesses are going to be turning to credit cards and yeah. other kinds of debt to just like float by until hopefully things get moving. Yeah, that's my sense too. And you know, it's interesting, the one form of debt relief that was in the CARES Act was student loan relief, which is not, I don't know that debt relief is quite the right way to put it, but basically it's a blanket across the board uh, pause of student loan payments. If you have federal student loans, direct federal student loans, uh, you don't have to pay them until the end of September. And that is actually retroactive to March 13th. So um, hmm. if you made a payment between the 13th of March and now, you can ask for it back if you want, if you're short on cash and you need that. They're also suspending um, interest. They're preventing interest from accruing on student loans in that period too. So there really is sort of uh, no reason to pay your student loans right now, unless you know you want you have your your job still. You're lucky, and you want to try to attack the principal. But that is sort of one of the across the board um, suspensions of debt right now. Um, beyond that, there really isn't debt relief. There are various um, eviction moratoriums in place in states. There's some at the federal level if you have a federally backed mortgage. Um, but beyond that, effectively, debt relief is like call your lender, call your credit card company and ask what they can do for you, which, you know, in a lot of cases, companies are working with people in various ways, but there's one, it requires people making that call. It requires people knowing they have the option to make that call and, and sort of getting over their anxiety and procrastination, which we all know those car, those calls are really hard to make. Mm -hmm. um, it's stressful. And, uh, yeah. you know, if, if that's what this, and, and also if people are just have so many other things on their plate, they, they may not prioritize that um, for a little while. So yeah, I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if there is more across the board debt relief that comes up in, in the next round, but thus far there hasn't been that much. Sam Fields, she's a reporter here at Marketplace covering uh, money, how it affects people's lives. And oh boy, is this a time for that beat. Sam, thanks a lot. I really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you guys. Thanks, Sam. Good to talk to you. Oh, man. All right. Speed. Heavy Speed. on the bootstraps. Um, yeah. Yes. If you are if you are a person in this situation, whether you're a small business owner applying for the SBA paycheck protection, if you're applying for unemployment for the first time, uh, we talked to a gig worker who is already in that situation where the state is like, I don't know how to get you yeah. gig worker benefits. Um, let us know. Be sure to tell us what state you're applying in. Like, just we'd love to hear your stories. It can be a voice memo or an yeah. email. I I can't promise I won't cry, but like I'll try. Send them <laughs> to make me smart <laughs> at marketplace.org. Now it seems like a good time to tell you I'm a crier. Molly's the crier. We'll be right, we'll be right back. Uh. <laughs> oh, look, we are. We'll be right back. Okay, there we, go. we are. All right, we're back. We're back. We're back. We're back. <laughs> the news is upon us. Uh, yeah. I'm so glad you picked yours because I was going to pick that. Of course, I was late today, oh. so you got to go first, metaphorically speaking, anyway. Um, but Amazing. I'm just going to pick right up where, where Sam left off, this idea of yeah. debt relief. And, and oh, by the way, that's going to be really troubling because two things. Yeah. Number one, Congress is not going to pass a federal debt relief statute. Number two, um, the debt doesn't just go away, right? Somebody's left holding the bag, and that's going to be a fight on debt relief. But mm -hmm. it's worth a note here uh, that according to the Mortgage Bankers Association— um, people are not paying their mortgages. Now, it's not a huge amount like it was in 2008 yet. It's just 2.6% of mortgages are in arrears, but that's up from like a quarter of a percent in the prior period. So I think a thing to watch here, because this is what people not paying their mortgages is what's going to turn this from a, a, um, a, a demand problem in this economy, right? People not buying enough stuff. People yeah. not paying mortgages is going to turn this into a financial system crisis. Because right. if those loans don't perform, and look, we saw this in 2008, if those loans don't perform, they've been securitized, lots of people are left holding the bag, and then that gets ugly in a hurry. So keep an eye on the mortgage market. Mortgage Bankers Association says the number of people not paying is going up. Look out. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah, we want our banks to be well capitalized, right? That's yeah. what we're saying here. Yeah. Um, we do. Yep. Wells Fargo, by the way, also on that note, in fact, um, suspended refinancing of jumbo loans which are loans hmm. over 
depending on where you live, between uh, five hundred and seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is like a lot of loans on the coast, um, obviously. And and basically said, nope, because you can't. They can't. They're having mm-hmm. a, those are hard to resell those loans. Right. So people who have really expensive houses in say the Bay Area or New York or L.A. Um, and by really expensive, like I should be clear, a starter house in Oakland is nine fifty. <laughs> so like, yeah. A lot of people are in a position where they can't necessarily refinance to take yep. advantage of those lower rates. I think they're still issuing them for now, but I took that as a warning sign for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also a warning sign that was breaking yeah. just as this we came huge. in that is also related, yeah, to this $2 trillion. Dollar. Uh-huh, exactly. It, like, doesn't seem that big, but it is big. So let me take you back to when Congress, <laughs> at the end of March— which is roughly one year ago in today's terms, eight days ago. Can you even remember that? Um, No. Remember when the stimulus bill was like headed for approval and all of it and Democrats slowed it down and everybody was like, why would they do this? And the reason that they did it is because they said there has to be oversight of the disbursement of the money in general and specifically this $500 billion, what was called a corporate liquidity fund. So money in there that could just go to companies and Democrats said, whoa, 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 like there's no there are not enough rules here to determine how this taxpayer money is going to get distributed, um, even compared to like 2008 and 2009 in terms of reporting to whom it went and how. Um, So the senator said, like, it is not optional that you have an inspector general who is in charge of overseeing this fund. It, this is like oversight required by law. They held up the stimulus bill over this one issue. Today, President Trump removed the inspector general who is in charge of that oversight. Booted him. Now, we should be uh, clear here. Inspectors general serve at the president at the pleasure of the president, Right. So it's not like, oh, my God, he's doing this illegal thing. What's often no. surprising is what's legal, not what's illegal. I will say, uh, I mean, the Democratic senators did say, quote, in their letter to uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin about this specific issue, faithful application of the law is not optional, is a requirement. Now, President yeah. Trump, the, in adhering to the law, it did appoint someone else, an acting yep. inspector general, to fill the position. Um but the person who was basically the appointment that was agreed upon in order to get the bill passed, that person has now been removed from that position. And this is a lot of your and our money at stake. And let's, it's a big let's deal. can I put on my historian hat for here for two secs? Please do. So let's remember what happened after TARP and the lack of transparency with TARP, right? The Troubled mm-hmm. Asset Relief Program back in 2008, the big bailout for the banks. People went bananas because 400 something trillion billion dollars was shoveled out into this economy without a whole lot of oversight, and people went nuts. And what did that get us? Yeah. It got us to occupy Wall Street. It got us yeah. the Tea Party. I, I think I've done this rant before, right? It got us to occupy Wall Street. It got us the Tea Party. It got us Bernie Sanders, and eventually it got us President Trump. Um, yeah. So this stuff has trickle down effects, pun intended, um, that might not seem immediately apparent. And I would submit that the blowback from this is going to be bigger than the blowback from lack of oversight about tarp oh absolutely because it yeah you know i yep well because this is just the start too of stimulus bills right there is more money that is going to be coming that will potentially have less oversight as a result of this there i mean there has to be this is like right pardon the plain talk but this is an insane situation you keep saying that you keep you keep saying that and yet here we have congress not being able to figure it out you know we do and the fact that they're i mean don't get me started on how they're on recess. I know. Yeah. Well, so, yes. But, I mean, they're on recess because most of them are over 65, and they would all die if they got in the same chamber together. So They don't they, have Zoom. like they're not working. Not that they should be using Zoom. They should <laughs> no, not. You, they you should can't, definitely you can't, have you can't a more secure. Vote. Yeah. Yeah, don't use Zoom. Can you imagine Zoom bombing they should dollars? definitely have a more secure mm. thing yes. than that, but they should have anyway. a thing. Um, anyway, it is a huge deal. I only raise it to say, and I'm glad that you agree with me, Huge. Oh, totally. 100%. Deal. Huge. Huge. All right. That's it. That's it for the news fix. I, oh, you're not I, going I think with we can two? all okay. agree. It was a little okay. bit of it. No, the number two was the history. 
That was for my own oh, 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 sorry. background. Okay, gotcha. Yep. No, gotcha. I only had one this time. Right. Look at me okay. with the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget uh, to sign up if you would like more news. Actually, just interesting information. Like Erica does a great job of not overwhelming you with the bummer. Like I believe we may have a little bit today. Um, please sign up for our Make Me Smart newsletter. It pops into your inbox. Hopefully we have just educated. We are just the more you know yeah. up in here. Yeah. Every Friday morning right. is how you get that newsletter. Lots of context about the COVID-19 outbreak, the economic implications, the tech, like all of it. And... Stuff to make you smile. Marketplace.org slash yep. newsletters. Your turn. Hi, Kai and Molly. This is Brent in Detroit. This is Rebecca from Baltimore. It was great to hear comments on my question about GDPR. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. So a couple of weeks back when this whole uh, quarantine, quarantine thing rather uh, had kind of just gotten started, we asked you to tell us how or, in fact, if... Stay at home was happening where you are. Lots of you wrote in. Here's a little bit of a snapshot of what you were seeing and some updates as well. We start in Iowa on a quick little cross-country road trip. It's with Nicole Fultz from a week ago. I wanted to let you know, she wrote, that Iowa is not doing shelter in place. We're all still going to work and not a lot of people are working from home. I would say about one quarter of the people here, that is Iowa, are practicing social distancing. The update goes like this. Governor Kim Reynolds out in Iowa has still not issued a stay-at-home order although apparently she's coming under some fire to get one a-going. Wow. Now to Tennessee. There's a pretty amazing story in the New York Times today, too, about Idaho, where they have one, but I don't know how familiar you are with Idaho. It's a state of some discontent, yeah. and so there is basically <laughs> like a liberty movement. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up next yeah. to Idaho. I know too much. Uh, but there's a yep. liberty movement now where they're saying like this stay-at-home order is unconstitutional, and they're trying to sort of contravene it that way. Um, now to Tennessee. Here's a voice memo from Chris Miller. Here in Chattanooga, we are not under any sort of government order to stay home, but all restaurants are takeout only and gatherings of 10 or more people are banned. I'm working from home this week, but last week I traveled to the rural parts of Tennessee for inspections and found a stark contrast between how the virus was being treated. The cities have been treating this seriously and have often led the state on measures such as shutting down schools and closing restaurants and bars. But while I was in a rural county that had no recorded cases at the time, I stopped at a diner for some coffee and got to talking with the owner. And she told me that her mostly older customers were still coming in for coffee in the morning and beer in the evening. And also, she was skeptical about the threat the virus posed. Hmm. I vigorously washed my hands after leaving that diner. And even after that scare, the coffee wasn't even good. <laughs> well, diner coffee. Man. Come on. <laughs> Diner coffee can be great. Uh, Chris sent, by the way, he sent that voice memo on March 23rd, again, roughly one bajillion Forever. years ago. Um, th but it was, in fact, just a little over two weeks ago. Last Thursday, April 2nd, Tennessee Governor Bill Lee finally issued a stay-at-home order. But as we know from various polling, uh, listen, like the level to which people are taking this seriously depends on mm -hmm. where they live and, frankly, what party they're in at this point. Like that is a clear divide in this country, mm -hmm. without a doubt. To Arizona, we go to round out the little road trip here. Amy Heckathorn wrote in to say this. After much criticism, she writes, the governor of Arizona issued a stay-at-home order for April that doesn't apply to essential services, but it looks like every job is an essential service. Golf courses are an essential service under this order. The disruption to the economy from the virus is bad, but the disorganization in governmental orders is causing more distress to the economy. Nobody knows what's going on. Eventually, they'll need to take stronger measures, and the problem will keep dragging on. I'm getting frustrated, she finishes, by the disorganized method of handling this crisis. The update goes like this from uh, mm. Amy's note. Governor Doug Ducey is getting a lot of blowback on that list, which does, in fact, include golf courses, also pawn shops and salons. Mayors are asking him uh, to narrow the list, make it more um, tight, and, um, you know, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. We will. The reason that we bring this up, by the way... <laughs> I, I heard like a great metaphor for this. And it's basically if some state, I mean, you know, look, Dr. Anthony Fauci, America's mm -hmm. doctor, has been on TV saying, <laughs> I don't understand why we don't have a national stay at home order. And the thing is, if we don't have a national stay at home order, it's kind of like saying, and I'm totally stealing this from Twitter and TV, uh, it's kind of like saying that there are parts of the pool that it's okay to pee in. <laughs> like, <laughs> You're kidding yourselves. You're kidding yourselves. 
Jesus right? It was like, I'm just saying that there is no more, like, you get that immediately. When you hear that, you're like, oh, oh boy. I gotcha. A gentler version of okay. that is that it's like saying that there are parts of the plane that it's okay to smoke in and the rest of it's non smoking, but you see what I'm saying here. Uh, okay. Mm hmm. Yeah. I got nothing. I got All nothing. right. One of uh, my favorite parts about the show <laughs> is just getting a, getting a freak Kai out by talking about pee. Uh, no is that it gives us a chance to hear from you guys and how this pandemic is affecting your lives in all sorts of ways. Our next one comes from listener Ellen Kleiman. It is a little bit heartbreaking. I don't know why they gave it to the crier, but here we go, uh, because I don't think that Ellen is alone in experiencing this. She says, my anchor job, and we've talked about this a lot on the show, Ellen says, my anchor job is actually what someone would consider a side gig, and I have a side gig on top of that. I'm a musician and teacher, a member of the creative class, my income and my husband's was almost entirely obliterated by social distancing. And we're trying to pivot and be nimble and all, but frankly, it's hard. Another blow fell yesterday. We lost our health insurance when my husband was cut from a restaurant contract that included some benefits. Now I'm left worrying that one of us will get sick, wind up in the hospital on a ventilator, and generate many, many thousands in debt we will never be able to repay. I know I'm not the only one in this situation. What do you do when your health care is tied to employment and a pandemic takes away your job? What will our children do if we get COVID-19? <laughs> don't give Laughing it to the crier. Like, cry. don't do that, that, you guys. All right. All right. Uh, yeah. No, so this is a so, so, so it's a note like this that makes you realize that this will be a generation generation shaping um, event. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, like like three weeks ago, people were saying, oh, yeah, there's going to be a V-shaped recovery and we're going to bounce right back because we were so strong going in. And that's not the way it's going to go. Peeps. No, Just the healthcare not. thing too. Did you see that chart that was going around Twitter that yeah. was like, "Here's how many people have lost healthcare in America since the pandemic started: 35 oh, million, yeah, yeah. or yeah. something like that." And then it was like every other country, zero. zero. Yeah. So many. Like we can't even tell you. I mean, this is a pivot point <sighs> in our country. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, and the challenge, event. of course, is recognizing the pivot point as it happens. And I'm not talking you and me and all the other you know gadflies out there. It's the people in authority with power to do something, not recognizing it. And that's the challenge. Yeah. yeah. That is the challenge. Uh, another challenge is making the turn into an upbeat, make me smart question. But I'm going to do that mm -hmm. right here. The question, of course, is you got what this, is something buddy. you thought you knew, but later found out you were wrong about. And because uh, we like to keep things a little light sometimes uh, on the way out of this show, um, we're going to do uh, another one from a staff member. Last week uh, was Ben. This week, Allison Vermeulen, she's communications manager here at Marketplace, works super hard, as do all the folks who help me and Molly get in front of the microphone. Um, and uh, she was also a huge fan of this pod. So here you go. This is mm. Allison Vermeulen. Hi, Kai and Molly. I am here to share something that I thought I knew, but it turns out I didn't. Um, in this COVID-19 situation, I've been cooking a lot more. And a recipe called for cilantro seeds. And I thought I was familiar with my herbs. And I didn't know what cilantro seeds were. Apparently, cilantro seeds are coriander. And cilantro is the Spanish word for coriander, they are the same thing. That's my fun little cooking tidbit. Thanks for the show. I was, I was, uh, it was not too long ago where I learned that myself. So I know, I remember it. learning that and just being like, ow, oh, I was yeah. probably, yeah. Yeah. Um, Allison, yeah. by the way, we have a group, a Slack group here at Marketplace, the MP <laughs> exercise group, and it's been mm. being passed really? around weekly. And Allison is in charge. And I would just like to say, that I'll show, although she is lovely and a big fan and I love her, she assigned us 120 squats in six minutes today. And so I'm just a little mad, a little mad at Allison today. What? What? Okay. I, it's okay. really good. It's really, I could start posting the exercises on Twitter if you guys want them. They're really, it's really, it's a good group. Yeah, I'm good. Good. All right. Before uh, we go, uh, a reminder <laughs> to check out a daily, I have a whole group chat that I post the exercises in I, every day. Like this is being all spread far and wide. It's a movement. about a movement uh, uh please check out our daily make me smart explainers as if you don't have enough to listen to but actually it turns out you guys don't like everybody needs some entertainment <laughs> here so uh <laughs> when you are separating your coriander from your cilantro they're the same thing ask your amazon lady uh to make me smart and have a listen there you go there you go that's made it. it to the end That's again, Molly. We, we made it to the end today. Just a reminder, 
This is the show for today. No 10 minute shorty. We'll yes. be back with oh, that yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Make yeah. Me Smart is produced and directed by Sam Anderson. Our digital producer is Tony Wagner. Our senior producer is Jody Becker. Thanks to our video producer, Ben Hethcote, our video intern, Ethan Peretz. And thanks to writer-producer, Erica Phillips. This week's program was engineered by Charlton Thorpe. Our theme music was composed by Ben Talladay and Daniel Ramirez. <laughs> I'm going to milk that as long as I can. The executive director of On Demand is Tatar Nieves. The senior vice president and general manager is Deborah Kavar. There we go. I I mean, I know I should know by now, but for a second, I thought we lost you. Like, I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> His internet broke. Does not come back one day. Oh, oh no. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, I got stung by a bee in the palm of my hand the other day, and it still itches. What? Yeah. Seriously? I would have raised the yeah. world's biggest fuss about that. How does the whole world not know about this?